Good morning. Uh, today's first talk is by Nick, and the topic is the Apache Way. Thank you. Thanks. OK, the Apache Way, how the foundation works, how we develop our software. So just so I can kind of gauge the room, who here is a committer? Who here is a member? Who here is a board member? Who here is just getting started and not quite sure what they've let themselves in for? All right, OK. So we've got some new people to explain to, and we've got some old hands in the audience to heckle and fill in the gaps, which I think is kind of partly what the ASF is all about, isn't it? Helping new people out, usually correctly, and someone popping along later and saying, oh, actually, you need to look at that page there. So. Um, my name's Nick Birch. I'm CTO at a company called Quanticate, which is a small data-focused CRO headquartered in the UK. We're about a tenth of the size of most of our main competitors. So one of the ways that we can compete against them is by being smart with the technology stack that we use to support our customers and our staff. And the way that we can be smart about that is using open source software. Right. This slide deck has been around in various forms for about six or seven years, I think. Um, somewhat like a project, every time someone gives one of these talks, we fork the previous version, hack around a bit, publish it out again. So um, Ross Gardler, Justin Ehrenkratz, Isabel Drost, and Lars Albrecht are the people who worked on the fork of the, co of the uh, slide deck that I'm using. Other forks may exist. And if you are finding yourselves giving a talk later on about the Apache Way and the Apache Software Foundation, if you look on the community development website, you will find various slide decks of people who've given talks on this kind of thing that you can learn from and pinch from. So what is the Apache Way? What I'm going to try and cover in the next 40 minutes is a bit about how the foundation works, how we go about developing code, what we found that works well, a few of the things that we have found that didn't work quite so well and we try to avoid. A little bit about business and Apache. As I've said, be based on some of the experiences of people in the room that I may pick on from time to time to, to help out. So some history. Where did, where did it all come from? Uh, in 1995, there was this sort of informal collaboration going on. About eight people working on the abandoned NCS a, uh, HTTPD. Um, server. So the web server had been developed, and then the original authors had lost interest in it, but the code was there. And there were people who were basing their business on top of this. And they were finding problems, they were working on it, they were enhancing it, and they were informally sharing around their enhancements, their new ways of doing it. Uh, and the, eventually they decided to call it the Apache patchy, because it was patches to the, um, so that, that sort of started in 1995, and the 1.0 release was just at the end of 1995. So we're almost 20 years now from that, that first start to it all. So that was 95. Skip forward a few years, a few more releases, a few more new features to 1999. Uh, there was commercial interest and commercial opportunities available around building on top of the Apache web server. And corporations tend to like dealing with other corporations or at least other corporate-like entities. And it's a bit hard to persuade them to deal with 20 guys and girls on a mailing list spread around the world, not all of whom have ever actually met each other. So it, there was some encouragement, there was some support, there was some advice was some understanding and learning about why a foundation might be important. And in the end, um, it was decided to form a 501c3 IRS um, registered charity. Uh, and it's a virtual worldwide organization spread all over the world. Um, we normally cover all the continents. I think we cover all the continents in terms of use, but it varies whether or not we've actually got any coders in Antarctica. But you know, if someone wants to sponsor, we've got loads of polar scientists on OODT and Tika. I'm sure one of them would love to be paid to sit in Antarctica and write Apache code just so we can tick off that, that 
final consonant. Uh, first Apache Con was held in March 2000. So we've been going quite a while uh, in terms of conferences. And the first European one was just after that. So today, we have hundreds of projects within the foundation. We've got tiny little libraries that do a single, well-defined, important task. We have critical infrastructure, things that underpin the web, things that underpin big data. We've got end user tools. And we try and have a well-defined project governance structure with mentoring and continual growth. Keep adding new projects, keep adding new things to the incubator, keep adding new committers, new community members, keep growing. So, by the numbers, or at least by the numbers from four days ago when I put together this slide, the thing with the ASF at the moment is that your numbers can go out of date before you even finish writing the slide deck. So, we've got 145 projects. The ASF started uh, in 1999 with two. The web server and conferences. Now we're up to 145. Um, we've got a, uh, 32 projects in the incubator. We've got nine uh, committees board committees, president committees, nine board members. We've got about 550 foundation members, about 2,000 people on the project management committees, about 4,000 people who are committers, and about 6,000 people who've submitted uh, an ICLA in preparation for committership or in preparation for making large code contributions. This is the list of projects. Every time we do one of these slides, we have to make the font size a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, as Chain mentioned yesterday, we really do need a project that starts with the letter Y, otherwise we've got them all covered. And there's just a huge variety there. We've got things that are tiny projects, things that are very specialized, things that are very general, very large, all, all mixed in together. And that can sometimes be a downside because it can be hard to work out what we've got and if we've got a relevant project. And I know that there, is, there has been talk this week about ways that we can make it easier for developers and, and new people to discover exactly what we've got. So the foundation, what's, what's the structure? It's one way to view it. You've got a foundation with a board. Below that, you've got a number of different projects, well, 150-odd different projects. Uh, some of whom have sub-projects, but we tend not to be so much of a fan of that. So you could think of it as a traditional structure, foundation, board, project, 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 all dropping down, but that kind of misses a lot about how we work. The way we try and say is it's a large number of projects grouped together by a single vision of how they develop software, and alongside there's some people in the background that try and keep the lights on and the servers running and deal with all that pesky legal and financial and those, those things that kind of get in the way of writing code and you're not interested in. But it should be all about these projects, writing code, building community, writing documentation, doing great stuff. In the background is the, is the foundation just keeping it all running along and occasionally going, there's this thing that may not seem that important to you code-wise, but actually it's going to be really important for your community, so we need you to spend a little bit of time on that and otherwise just sitting back and getting on with the day-to-day -day stuff that allows the coders to keep coding, the communities to keep growing. And the board provides oversight. It does not set coding direction. The board has no say on what code is going to get written, nor does it have anything to say about the direction a project is going to take. Jim can't turn up on the Hadoop list and say, you know what, I think you should just like rewrite that bit in C, it'll be much better. Well, he could, but they would probably check the calendar and laugh. And <laughs> but he has no, as a board member, he, he can't go in and say, you should do this coding-wise. The board has no say about what projects we do and don't have. The board doesn't say, oh, for strategic reasons, we think we need another big data project. The board and the foundation accepts the communities that come to us, but we have no direction in terms of what we get we don't go, oh, we need another one to complete the strategy. We say, if a project wants to come to us, that's great. If they don't, that's their choice. And the foundation has some common support, things like infrastructure, press, and trademarks that let the projects get on with the code and let everything else run in the background. We have a few 
special kind of projects within the foundation that let things go on. So one of them is Apache Labs. It's kind of a funky thing. We do have some rocket scientists in the foundation, but I don't think we've persuaded them to open source any designs or anything. So normally, within the foundation, the important thing about the projects is the community. Labs is a bit special. So it's somewhere where existing committers can go who have an idea about the code but don't yet have the community. And they can go there and they can experiment. You can't release from Labs. You can't um, do anything special there except build some code and then say, hey, this is great, this is working, let's take it to another project or let's take it to the incubator or go, hmm, that was interesting. We've learned something. Move on. So it's, it's a very special area for committers to go and, and hack on some code, but it's different from the rest of the foundation because it's not about the community. It's where you experiment and then you go and build the community later. So that's Labs. The incubator, where all of our new little podlings come from. So quite often, there is an open source project out there which has a working code base, and it has a community, and the community decides that they want to come to the ASF. But they're not going to be working in the way that the ASF works yet, because they've been developing outside, developing their own way. So when the project comes to the incubator, we help them adjust their processes and their ways of working to follow the Apache model. When a project's in the incubator, that's not saying anything about the code. Incubation says nothing about the quality of the code. It's all about the community. So a project can come in that's had the 1.0 release, great, stable, and they come into the incubator and we help them sort out any of the legal issues, get all the code checked, get all of the licensing in place, make sure all the dependencies are under the right licenses, help them understand the importance of the Apache way of the community and everything like that. And then when that's all working properly, they graduate to a top level project. Or you can have a project that comes in which is really active code base, still months off a 1.0 release, and they can graduate without a 1.0 release. As long as the community understands how it works, as long as the licensing stuff is in place, as long as the release process is in place, they can graduate without having done that 1.0 release. Because the community's there, and we can have faith that they're going to go on and, and achieve that point. Obviously, we've got all of our top-level projects, all 145 of them. And we have the Apache Attic, the end of the line for projects. It's not to say that projects in the attic, the code is dead. Things go to the attic because the community has drifted away. Typically, that is because the technology is no longer all that relevant, which is why there's not enough people around to maintain it. What's happened is that there's not the community there to provide the oversight. If someone finds a bug, if someone finds a security release, there's not three people left to review that change, push out a new release. The community has effectively died. And at that point, we move it into the attic so it's clear to everyone that the community is not there. It's entirely possible that later on, that technology will rise in importance again, and then a new community will form, and we can bring it back out of the attic. The code's still there. It's still open. You can still go and get it. You can still look at it. You can still build on it. But what we're saying is there's no longer the community that you would expect to maintain that project. So sort of in the process, you make that call? So every quarter, projects produce a report to the board about the state and health of their community and any issues affecting that. Typically, what will happen is that a project will stop reporting to the board because there's no one left. Then the board will check, will see that. Then they'll go back to the community what's left and say, hey, you're, you're on the verge of going to the attic. Is there anyone left here? And if there is, if there are people in the community who are still interested who weren't on the PMC, you to kind of do a reboot, get those people into the PMC, keep it going. But if there's no one left with interest, then the board will pass a resolution, move it into the attic, update the website to say, code is still here, community is gone. So I've just described the perfect way that it all works. But sadly, it isn't all perfect. So going back a few years, I think it would have been about 
2006, 2007, there was one project called Jakarta, which had got very big. It was an umbrella for all of the Java projects. So all of the Java projects within the foundation were part of Jakarta, part of the ASF. It was a very successful brand in its own right. You know, it was the home of Tomcat, it was the home of Struts, it was the home of Ant, it was the home of Poi, which is the project that originally drew me in. They were all, all there, all doing great things. And it started to copy the foundation structure and had its own mini board. And there was a problem with Avalon. And it wasn't clear who was responsible, who was going to be looking after that. Was that the mini Jakarta board that was going to be looking after it, the project management committee? Was it the main board? How was it working? What about the people who were part of Jakarta who didn't really understand that they were part of the ASF and they were doing their own thing and there wasn't the oversight? And eventually, the board decided with the project management committee that this was not working. And what was required was to flatten it out and have all of the projects be equal with each other, reporting to the board, the board providing oversight. The eventual conclusion was to close down that project, promote out all of those that could graduate, formed a whole load of new projects. I think it must have been about 20 in the space of six months. Maybe one of the biggest spikes in growth was when all the projects got pushed out of Jakarta up to top level. Jakarta was closed down. We went back to having a single model where all projects report to the board. So all of those 145 all reporting quarterly to the board. And sometimes you will hear people say, oh, well, should we have a one for this big data space? Can we have a, like a big data mini foundation? And we say no. The reason we say no is we've tried it, and it, it, it didn't work. And it, the Jakarta demonstrated that umbrellas are bad, that we need to have visibility all the way down. The board needs to be able to see what's going on. The communities need to be able to report straight back up to the board if they're having problems, if their communities are working. Can we run the mic to Jim? Because my involvement was this was as a committer coming into a Jakarta project at the time it was all crumbling down. And I had no idea what was normal and what wasn't normal. All I knew was it was all going. Yeah, the, the, the question was um, what was the rationale behind it? Was it because there were too many layers between the underlying people and the, and the board? Um, and actually, it, it wasn't that. It was, uh, as, as Nick kind of like alluded to earlier, uh, there were people who were um, in these basically Apache projects. They were, you know, sub-projects inside of Jakarta who really had no understanding of some of the ideals and tenets of the so-called Apache way. You know, there was this disjunct culturally between a lot of these, uh, you know, Jakarta subprojects and the ASF in general, and so um, as Jakarta would start growing, those conflicts and contrasts because of those cultural differences uh, became an issue. Yeah, 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 and and the other thing is. The other, uh, you know, Phil reminds me, is, is there were actually very, very few members of the ASF within the Jakarta subproject because, again, there was, you know, the culturally, so you had this huge, pro, uh, huge umbrella project with a whole bunch of uh, really, really active projects, active people, but uh, they weren't getting a voice at the upper level as well. So culturally, it just made sense to flatten everything out and make sure that we're all under uh, operating under the same cultural tenets, but also making sure that every project and every committer had the same uh, you know, voice and level in the, in the entire foundation. OK. Thanks, Jim. So one, one thing I've mentioned in passing is that the projects will now report to the board every quarter, unless they've got a problem, in which case they can report more often. Quarterly is the maximum. Monthly is available. So typically, if a project's going through a big change, or it's just graduated, or there's been some community issues, they'll be reporting every month. And they're reporting about the community. They're not reporting about the code. They're not saying, oh, we fixed this problem. We've come up with a decision on this. They say, we've had discussions. They're going well. We've added some new people. We've done some releases. Or they say, just to give you a heads up, there's a bit of an issue. We're not dealing with user patches in time. 
We've not added any new community members for a few months. We're starting to get worried we're going to have to do some thinking ourselves. So it can force the community to do community evaluation of their own health. And the board can intervene, but it intervenes on community, not on code. The board doesn't come in and say, hey, you need to fix that bug. The board comes in and says, we're really worried that you've not added any new committers for the last year. And we're really worried that we're hearing grumblings from your community that they're being ignored. The board doesn't say you're ignoring the patches. The board says there is a problem here that you need to work about. Go and speak to these people. They'll help you. They'll mentor you. So a wider ecosystem. We don't pick winners. We pick the runners. The board doesn't say, we should do this. Developers say, this is cool, and we'd like to be at Apache. And then they're welcomed in. So we enable the developers to do great stuff. And we're quite willing to say there's more than one way to do that. So we'll very frequently have more than one project in a space. We try and ask that they have a way to describe themselves that's different, so that when someone new comes in and says, I need to do this, this thing with Apache, and there are two projects, how do I pick between them? We say it's kind of good if the communities can say to a new person what the difference is. Hey, we do message queuing, but we do it in a in a really um, efficient, very low latency way. Hey, we do message queuing, and we scale up to big data scale. If you come in and say, oh, well, I'm interested in a message queue, and you go, well, what's important to me? Do I care about latency, or do I care about scalability? I can pick my community. You're yeah, both doing messages, but they have a distinction to their communities so that they, people know which one's going to be right for them. And then it's fine to have more than one of them. So we support the communities. We support the people who are interested in developing. In the background, we have a few different communities that keep it all running. So we've got the infrastructure team, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers running, the mailing list going, the build farms behaving, everything like that. We've got the legal team, who deal with any queries about licenses and all those sorts of fun things, debating about whether a point release on a particular open source license means it's fine or not, and all those kind of queries. We have those who are involved in conferences and in community events. We've got the Travel Assistance Committee, who help people get to Apache events who couldn't otherwise afford to be there. We've got the Fundraising Committee, who run the sponsorship program and bring in all the money that, that, that pays for the infrastructure that keeps everything running. We've got the Public Relations part, Press, who answer queries from people outside the foundation writing about us, who typically are on a deadline, don't really understand open source all that well, really don't understand how it works, and they just need to speak to someone and say, can I get a one-line quote about this? And then Press, which is mostly Sally, then turns around and she knows all of the communities, and she can be that single point of contact for Press so that when there's something about our projects in the Press, we can get our message out there too, rather than someone saying to a journalist, what you need to do is you need to join the dev list and then you need to post. And maybe within two or three days, long after the story's gone, then maybe someone will remember to come back and, and help you out. That does happen if you're not involved in press. That is how you get involved. But there's different time sensitivities. And if, if the newspaper presses are going to be rolling in six hours and they need a quote, then, then we have to, in order to get the word out, in order to build our communities, we need to be able to turn around quicker responses on that. Uh, just a quick question. Who then is responsible for speaking on behalf of Apache? So if I'm a small, say if I'm a top level project and on the PMC and the press contacts us, uh, and are we representing Apache at that point or are we representing the project under Apache? Um, typically, if you get a query from the press, it will come from Sally. If it doesn't, loop Sally in and she can help advise. Um, it depends. Um, there are formal statements made by Apache. There are formal statements made by Apache projects, but typically there will have been a, a, a vote or a decision on the project to make that formal statement. Most of the statements that get made get, by, get made by members of the project. So if you're going to be saying something non-controversial, then there's no problem with you saying, hey, I'm, I'm Nick and I'm involved in Apache Poi in someone's asked a question and I'm going to make 
a statement as a member of the project about that. Now, if it was something controversial and there's a lot of debate, then maybe you want to work together as a project to come up with your formal response that you all agree with that then gets sent out. But that's separate. For a lot of the questions that come in, it's fine for it to be an unofficial response from someone involved in the project. But if it's something very controversial, if there's some sort of major community issue blowing up with one of the companies involved doing something that's not great for the rest of the project, then you might need a, a formal considered response. But if you're not sure, check, check with Sally. She's the expert on it. But it, if so if we respond to the press, we would not be representing Apache. Qua Apache would be representing the project that is within Apache, though. I said first, actually, yourself. I mean, even the project. Uh, the if you go back to the you know the statements about um, you know what what the board decides on behalf of the projects, it's it's actually sort of the same at the PMC level. The PMC does not say, okay, you know, we're going to get in a, in a in a closed room and decide this is what we're doing with this project. That those decisions are made by the community. So when you think about making a statement on behalf of the project, that statement has to be made on behalf of the community, unless it's just a statement by an individual. Yeah, most, most of the things that a company might want to make a formal statement about, direction, releases, that kind of thing, they're community decisions. Yeah, you're going to be sending out an announcement about your 1.5 release. Well, What's going to be in the announcement? Well, it's going to be that we've released, and it's going to be we've released on this date, and it's going to be about the new features we've put in. Well, the release was voted on in public, and the release notes were hopefully collated by the rest of the community. They were more often than not, it's one poor sap in the corner going, oh, stop, stop, we've got to get the release notes in before we can... But, you know, it's a community thing. And then you make the announcement about your new release with all the things from within the community. It's very rare that that you need to make a statement, a formal official statement on behalf of the project that's not about something that's out in the open. If, if in doubt, check with Sally. She will help guide you through the awkward world of what people outside Apache think certain words mean and what we think certain words mean, which can be a bit of a culture. Um, and the, the final bit on this slide was the security response team. So if someone finds what they think is a security problem with one of our projects, they contact the security team. The security team work with the project to get that fixed and help mentor the team through that. Some projects get a lot of security vulnerabilities reported. They know how to work with it. Some projects might get one every two years. And the previous guy who worked on it's now left the project. And they're going, well, we know how to fix the bug, but then what? There's this, this CV thing, and then we and, um, help. And then the security response team points the documentation and, and help them through that process, which is maybe not something that happens a lot for them. So, nearly everything in the foundation is done by volunteers. There's a couple of special cases for a few of the bits on here, which need to get done, otherwise the foundation doesn't work. You can't really say to the IRS, well, we found, we found a bug and we've decided to push out the, uh, the release of the, the tax stuff for, for a couple of weeks. Um, community vote on it, I'm sure that's fine, isn't it? Yeah. IRS doesn't quite work. You can't really announce a conference and then say, oh, well, we're not quite sure that we've got one of the tracks right, so we're just going to slip the conference by a week. So there are, there are a few kind of things that intersect with the real world where we need to have things working in real time without volunteers. So they tend to get 
done its paid stuff, but the rest of it is all volunteers, and especially all of the coding is done by volunteers. Many of those volunteers have a day job who's paying them to work on the project, but they're there as a volunteer. No, one's, no one in the foundation is telling them what to work on. They're working on things that interest them, that hopefully, all being well, also interest their employer, and so their employer is keen for them to keep going. But that's their decision, that's not a foundation decision. So we have absolutely no paid committers. If you want to have a feature added, you can't come to the foundation with a checkbook and say, please write this feature. You go to the community and either write it yourself or inspire the community to do it or pay someone in that community to do it. Or someone outside that community is then going to join in later. But you can't go to the foundation and say, I need this feature, please write it. Could I just catch you saying that if I'm uh, part of a community, I can solicit funds for a particular earmarked feature for the project? With a caveat. So, you can come to me and say, I need you to add a feature to Apache Poi. And I have to say, ah. You can come to me and say, I need you to add a feature to my private copy of Apache Poi. That's fine. You know, you've got the source code, you've got trunk, I can work on a new feature, and I can guarantee that in exchange for your money, I will give you that code. And I can also say, I will submit that to the project, and if I'm a good community member, then I'll know how to write it so that everyone in the project goes, awesome, commit. But I can't promise you that it will get in. Now, if you're doing a lot of this and everyone knows you and stuff, you can say, well, I'm sure it's going to be fine. Everyone knows me, everyone knows that it's a sensible thing to do. So I can promise to write some software that will target a particular release of an Apache project that you can have. But I can't guarantee it will go in. Though done right, you can generally say that the community will accept it because if you hire someone who's in the community, they know where the community is going, what the community wants, and they can turn around to you at the start and say, I can take your money, but you're not going to like the result. Does that, does that make sense as, as the distinction? Most of the time you hire someone in Apache to do something sensible, it can go in. But they can't promise it, because it's a community decision. So, got a little bit of time left. Some more on the Apache way. One way that people describe it is having a, a chain of merit. Another thing to think about is there's a steadily reducing number of people. And in order to stop this thing falling over, we need to be welcoming in new people at the bottom. So for every foundation member, there's, I think it's about eight or nine at the moment, uh, project members. For every project member, there's um, several committers. For every committer, depending on the project, there's somewhere between 100 and a million users. And say Apache Open Office is probably the one with the biggest difference between the number of users and the number of committers. Some other projects that are a bit more esoteric, Apache Steve maybe has a much smaller number of committers to, to user ratio. But in a way, that's good, because once you've started using it, you're then very, very likely to start submitting patches and, and get in. With Open Office, they don't have so many committers, but they have this huge user base. There's this huge pool of potential people to get involved in. And the challenge there is giving them ways to go from being someone who downloaded OpenOffice and used it and found a problem to getting them into the community. So they then have the forums. They then have lots of mentoring around the documentation and things to try and harness that huge pool of potential and get it in. Any project that doesn't welcome new people, that doesn't build its community, is going to die. All of us who are involved in a project now, there's a certain point in our life, certain set of circumstances that allow us to be there, and that's going to change. So we need to be dream bringing in new people all the time, and the project will evolve, and the community will change. And if we're not welcoming to those users, how are we going to get the people going up that chain? To, to keep refreshing the whole foundation. So remember, be welcoming to the new guy, new girl, just join the project list with this apparently stupid question. Play nicely with them and help them understand. 
six months' time, they might be your new project lead. So, there are many ways to get involved. And sometimes people outside Apache forget this. Sometimes people inside Apache forget this, and we mustn't do. Any constructive contribution can earn merit. Any constructive contribution under our license. Um, you could write some great stuff that builds on top of it, but if it's under a license that's not compatible, then that's earning merit elsewhere. We can't accept that. And it's not just code. It can be evangelism, going out and telling people about the project, telling them how to get involved. Very important one, and one that you should be encouraging new people to do, is the bug reports and triage. If you find a problem, report it. If you see someone's had a problem, try and reproduce it. Try and classify it. They'll come in and say, sometimes my document doesn't work right. It doesn't have to be a committer who works with that person to, to, to help them produce a better bug report. It could be anyone in the community. Anyone in the community can try the patch out and say, hey, this, this patch still works for me, or well, that solves the problem. They can help out in testing. They can help out in documentation. They can help review the designs. They can help out supporting users. Loads of really important things can be done as a way of contributing to the project that aren't just writing lines of code. Some communities do better jobs than others of welcoming those things. And there have been other talks this week and I think later on today about encouraging some of those other ways of getting people involved to get a wider project. Did you have a query? by a community member, self defined, I suppose, is in, has to be done per the Apache way, I presume. In other words, um, the people who are going to be trying to evangelize have to be uh, indoctrinated in the Apache way or have to be cognizant of it before they can be effective evangelists, presumably. And so that's going to be sine qua non? Well, it depends on how much evangelism they're doing. If you're on Stack Overflow and you're answering questions that people have and your answer is what you want to do is go and use Apache Foo and here's the 10 lines out of their example that solve your problem using Apache Foo. They're evangelizing Apache Foo. They may not be a committer. Most of them aren't. They're just smart people out there who've seen that kind of problem before and say, well, the answer to your problem is this Apache project here, and here's some code snippets to show you how that's going to work. That's someone evangelizing the project. They don't know anything about, you know, tomorrow's question, they might be saying, oh, the best thing is this piece of proprietary software here. I know it's expensive, but it's the only option. They're evangelizing the project. Now, someone who stands up in front of a conference and says a lot of things about the project probably needs to be aware of the Apache way so that they can make the right kind of statements. And every so often, someone evangelizing it from a company's marketing team will overstep the bounds and may need a, a bit of a chat about the Apache way and how to represent it. But a lot of the evangelism that can be done can be done by anyone. The, the, the evangelism that's making press releases and, and giving conference keynotes is at the apex. Most of the evangelism is just people on mailing lists, people on forums, people chatting in the pub saying, oh, yeah, this is the thing that you want to look at. And we need to welcome that kind of lower level evangelism. So it's often worth just going on Stack Overflow. Find the tag for your project. Look at the people who have been answering. Try and match the ID on Stack Overflow from the time they posted something to the mailing list or to the bug tracker. And maybe say, hey, I see that you've written some really, really great examples in some of your answers, much better than in our documentation. Any chance you want to kind of contribute them over and draw them in that way? Because there are some really knowledgeable people about our projects who are not on our user and dev list. And it's always worth sometimes looking, looking outside, doing the old Google search, see what's going on, and draw those people in. All contributions are equal. Merit doesn't buy you authority. Just because you're on the PMC, doesn't mean you get to decide. Gets you privileges, such as the commit access, the ability to make changes directly, and it gives you some 
say, in resolving conflicts. But generally speaking, it's the community that decide on the direction. It still takes an individual to do it. As a community, you can decide on this brand new feature that's going to be awesome and world-changing. There are no magical developer fairies that are going to come running along to then fill it out. Your community, the individuals in it, then still need to implement that plan. But it's the community that sets the direction, and then the individuals who execute. Almost all decisions are reversible. So we have the saying, if it didn't happen on the list, it didn't happen. Got a question? Can you? Can you go back a slide? Sorry. OK, so you said the, a com the community agrees on the direction. Is there an expectation then that um, there's a roadmap for these projects that's published that the community gets to give input to the design? Something like a roadmap, but maybe not something that a Prince 2 certified project manager would no, ever recognize. No, but, so for but some it's not something that's done on a private email right. within a company. It's something that is submitted to the community as part of the design direction. Or just evolves out of the community. Quite a lot okay. of the projects I'm involved in, uh, there's half a dozen active committers. Mm -hmm. And the roadmap for the next release is everything in JIRA tagged with the next release number. That's okay. the roadmap. That's what's going to be in the next release, plus okay. anything that we come up with. Because we're a small project, and if you want something in the next release, you open a bug and you tag it, and someone will say, well, actually, I'm not sure we're going to get that done in this release unless you want to put in some work. But then on the other side, you've got some very big projects with lots of corporate involvement. And in those cases, maybe you do want to have formal voting and decision about what should and shouldn't be in, and if something should be in trunk, or if something needs to go off into a branch. Mm -hmm. and be developed in a branch and experimented on, and then the community can come back. So if one, do you want to say your thing and then I'll carry on a bit? Yeah, I was going to say this, the key thing is it all has to happen in public. So to the extent to which there is a roadmap or a plan or you know, a set of open JIRA tickets, all that is happening in public. If someone, you know, if, if a project is going to lay out, here's what we're going to do in you know, version 8, 9, and 10, then it, it, very often individuals will step up and, and you know, say, here's, here's what I want to do. But it, it, to the extent that the project actually makes those decisions, it has to be in public. And what if they're not? It, what do you mean, what if they're not? <laughs> I, well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my question. Um, then you raise it. Well, but I mean, like, I'm involved in a project and that roadmap isn't really public and, you know, their release schedule isn't published. And so it's, you know, for us who are trying to become committers and to contribute to the project, it's, it's like we're, we're searching for information where we can be useful, but there's, there's nothing out on the wiki. You know, I mean, there's it hundreds is, of JIRAs a day. It's, it's I really... I think the question is, is there a roadmap that you're not seeing, or is it just a project with no roadmap? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's a, a published roadmap, it seems to be. But is, if there's a private roadmap, we've got a problem. If it's a project that just kind of says, well, when, when we all feel happy, we'll, we'll close off some bugs and roll the release. So mm. some of the projects I'm involved in, you can look on the JIRA and see what's coming up in the next release. But the decision on when that release happens is based on everyone's interest, er which is different from. You said that the board hardly ever gets involved. Okay? Mm -hmm. Something like that, that's when the board gets involved. Yeah. The board says, you know, this, you know, we're aware of this, this is not good. You know, and, and that's something the board takes very, very seriously. Um, okay. How does the board get, what process gets the board involved besides your hyper awareness of reality of everyone? Right. Well, I mean, usually that's why we, we have. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to cover a few more things I think are important. So, 
Decision making, most decisions are reversible. If it took place in public and everyone saw it, and it was small, you can generally just get on and do it and, and revert it later. For controversial changes and things that can't be undone, you propose a plan, you wait a minimum of 72 hours, ideally a bit longer. The 72 hour minimum is to allow people from all around the world who maybe have different days off and different public holidays and things, for them to have a chance to see it and weigh in, and then you can make the decision. So that's why we say the minimum 72 hour rule it's to give everyone a chance. Now, there is debate happening later on today about ways that we might be able to let everyone have their say in short periods of time. That's something that the ASF is currently looking at, but we are very concerned with making sure that everyone who wants to from the community can weigh in on decisions. Decisions made when required, plus one for yes, minus one for no, zero for a maybe. You can't just minus one something. You have to minus one with a reason. I don't think we should do this because it breaks the project on ARM. I don't think we should do this because it's going to introduce a security problem. I don't think we should do this because someone in the community last week proposed a different way of fixing that problem that looks better. Can't say, I don't want you to do that because my company was planning to sell something a bit like that, and it's going to destroy our business model if you guys give it away for free. No. I don't want you to do it because of. You had a very quick question. Yeah. So no normally. It Normally, people would say, like, plus zero. That looks OK, but I've not had a chance to actually read it in enough detail to be sure. Or minus zero. I think there might be something wrong, but I can't articulate it, so maybe someone else wants to do that for me. But it's only those. But it's rare that you need this. Extensions. Sorry? If you don't vote, <laughs> OK. And then one final thing is um, we'll often say, you know, if it didn't happen on the list, it didn't happen, where are those lists? All the project website should have a, a list of their lists. And typically, there's a dev at, which is where the primary developers list commits at, which is an automated thing of all the changes happening. User or users at, often but not always, is where you find all the users. And if you go to mail archives, you'll find a list of all of the public mailing lists for all of our projects. And then finally, no jerks allowed. You do need to be nice. For your community to grow, continue to work, you need to play nicely with each other. If you've not seen this video here, tonight, take an hour, watch it. It's really, really good, really informative. Every one of you should see it. On a bad day, you will do some of the things in that video. On a good day, you will make some of the mistakes with trolls described in that video. So seriously, if there's one video you're going to watch after this, it should be that one. I'm going to skip over the, the business bits. Um, and no. I've had the questions. So thank you to all the people at the top who've contributed towards the slide deck. Community track runs all day. If you've got any more questions, there's a chance it may be covered in a later session. Otherwise, find anyone with, ask me. During lunch, during breaks, whatever, ask them. They may not know the question, but there's a high likelihood that they'll know the person who knows the answer and will introduce you later. OK, thank you. Thank you.